Welcome to the opening of Finding D&D, based on Finding Jesus. As if that weren't controversial enough, but the aptness is such that I can't resist. Because are we talking about a publication, an activity of play, an ordinary feature of an ordinary activity, hobby, or are we talking about something far more ineffable and far more significant to us that is to be found either in the distant past, in a kind of age of legend, or maybe it's to be found, uh, well, any minute now, coming soon, or perhaps it's to be found by looking in our hearts or something similar. I'm going to argue that the relationship of Dungeons and Dragons to role-playing is a religious one. Before I can even begin to address all of the responses and all of the possible objections, let's start with something, I think, completely non-controversial and also useful to consider, which is simply a look at some publication history. I'm not talking about an insider view or a personal account of who did what when. All of that has seen significant scholarship in the last 10 years and uh, has been done and done again and is available to anybody. I'm talking about something just a little bit different. First, getting at the point that when one says Dungeons and Dragons, we cannot in any way at any point in the history of the hobby be talking about a single published text. Let's take a look at that. The early days in this regard, I'm speaking to some extent from a personal account of my own. You may factor in your own personal account as a matter of contrast, or you might be looking at this effectively from my perspective from the future, gazing upon these odd events in a cell phoneless land and time. So, what do we see? Non-controversially, the first publication of Dungeons & Dragons was at Gen Con in 1974 in Geneva, Wisconsin. Well, again, all of this is a matter of record. I don't really want to talk about a matter of record of who was the publisher and who did what and who said what to whom. I want to talk about what it was like for everybody else. The outsiders, us. We have the brown box is what we're looking at. People call it white box. It wasn't a white box. It was a brown box with white stickers. And furthermore, it had three booklets in it. Following upon its publication, over the course of the next two to three years, came similarly brown pamphlets looking very much like the original three pamphlets inside the brown box and they uh, were titled Greyhawk, Blackmoor, Eldritch, Wizardry, Gods, Demigods and Heroes, and Swords and Spells. So those to some extent one might think would comprise the first Dungeons and Dragons text, the brown box and those five booklets. And perhaps that would be the case, except for two considerations. Consideration number one, the brown box disappeared. There were a thousand copies released at Gen Con. There were perhaps some more of those published in the next couple of years. I've heard some people say there weren't. I've heard some people say there were. But regardless, even if there were, the numbers in question were surprisingly low by any standards. What I'm saying is that to us, the outsiders at our hobby stores, which were mostly model airplane stores and places like that at the time, there wasn't any. People said Dungeons and Dragons. Someone heard that someone had said something about Dungeons and Dragons, but there wasn't any. Those booklets appeared not in sequence with fanfare on a special shelf for the role-playing games or anything like that. One or another might appear. I had two of them. The publications that were available during those years, 
were mostly Judges Guild supplements, a whole bunch of characters to use. Um, other publications on and off, Dragon Magazine began in 1976, and so Dragon Magazine started to appear again on and off. It's not like today when the issue is scheduled to come out at a certain time and then you go there on Dragon Magazine day of the week, of the month, and you get your Dragon Magazine that the person has made sure that you're going to get your copy of. Nothing like that. So you have this incredibly scattershot access to any kind of text called Dungeons and Dragons. At this point, we're looking at a couple of other publications too. Uh, the Empire of the Petal Throne. We're looking at uh, Boot Hill. And certainly um, Traveler, Chivalry and Sorcery, Early Rune Quest, uh, the Arduin Grimoire. Uh, began uh, and was made available at least in Britain in 1977. It would be showing up in the States a little bit later. Tunnels and Trolls. The Fantasy Trip began um, with metagaming on uh, a series of small pocket wargamey like games and one of them started to look a little bit suspiciously like a fantasy role-playing game with Melee and Wizard. So by 1977-78 the, this sort of scattershot notion that there was this role-playing thing at the time it was called fantasy wargaming people were not really calling them role-playing games yet and you had this notion as an outsider that there was this phenomenon out there and you were looking for the texts and the name that was used more than any other was dungeons and dragons so you hunted and maybe in this particular summer activity made available through the community a couple of adults would be playing dungeons and dragons so you signed up for that and you went to that you went to the hobby store and you saw whether anybody was playing dungeons and dragons and some kids standing there holding miniatures says we play D, D, and so you went and you met them so there was really very little understanding of what this thing is and there was no book to pick up when you tried to pick up a book you would find a couple of those secondary pamphlets. You would find a few issues of Dragon Magazine. You would find what somebody said this was how, this was what to do, actually, to conduct play. Hobby stores had been provided with a banner that said Dungeons and Dragons Headquarters, and you went into there looking for Dungeons and Dragons, and the guy would hand you a box of lead miniatures and he might hand you the latest issue of the dragon, most particularly a Judge's Guild supplement, and you kind of walked out wondering what to do. In 1977, this changed when Dungeons and Dragons was made available. And this is the famous J. Eric Holmes version. Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax's names are mentioned. I don't think it's controversial to say that this was basically a game written by J. Eric Holmes with a whole bunch of the material to date at hand. And as far as I can tell, it's the first really codified step-by-step, -step, this is what you do, this is how you play version of D&D. &D. And it was published steadily between 1979's set of editions all the way up, I guess, all the way through 1980 or so and it had uh, received some minor changes along the way and one would say okay so this is D&D this is Dungeons and Dragons maybe this is kind of the first although the first takes on much weight in a discussion of this kind and it certainly was the first thing that a kid could actually go and buy in their hobby store and had as opposed to the effectively invisible brown box now, what we have in looking at this thing is a very interesting promise from the publisher, which is that this was going to be the introductory D&D. It was not called Basic Dungeons & Dragons on the front. It was called Dungeons & Dragons, and it would take you through levels one through three. Sooner or later, coming soon, would come Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which would begin at level four and carry you up further on. This was the promise. And so you ended up uh, buying this box. Now, as you went along, at first you had paper chips in there to use for the different sides of the dice because the polyhedral dice were extremely hard to find. Then, quite soon, and the version I had, 
there were the plastic dice that came with it. You may have seen some of these beat up cheap plastic dice that uh, I, for one, have treasured many a year. And they all, they're all basically spherical after, you know, rolling all these years. So the, uh, the, the deal with this box, though, you would say, great, we have D&D. Two things made this difficult, especially concerning the promise of the advanced Dungeons & Dragons to come, which you can read all about and be promised this over and over again in the pages of Dragon Magazine. What did you find? You found, number one, practically on the heels of this publication, the Monster Manual came out. This is a hardback book, and you can find it in Walden Books. This is culturally just mind-blowing, right there in a royal bookstore, Dungeons and & Dragons. And you didn't have to go off to, you know, Joey's Hobby Shop next to the gas station anymore. You could actually walk in there and buy it like, you know, like a real book. And it looked like a real book, you know, Knock Knock. It really has this kind of cool bookiness to it. And so you, thrilled, ran off to your copy of Holmes, or in my case... The isolated blue rule book from inside the Holmes box, the rest of my Holmes box, I have no idea what ever happened to it in the first month of me owning it. So all I had left was the blue book and a couple copies of uh, a couple copies of Dragon Magazine, and I had uh, let's see, a Judges Guild pack. I think it was a town pack of some kind. I had Melee and Wizard rounding that out. I think I had a copy of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which was the Tunnels and Trolls magazine, and a couple of other odds and ends. So there I was, looking at the Monster Manual and saying, all right, we can use this Monster Manual. This is the advanced Dungeons and Dragons that goes with this, dun the real, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons. We're great. We can go up and level an hour, at least have monsters to do that. And guess what? The rules had almost no compatibility at all. In particular, armor class worked alarmingly different. So you are kind of puzzled at looking at this monster manual and looking at these rules and not quite sure what on earth is going on. Simultaneously, effectively, in 1978, the hobby stores received another publication called Dungeons and Dragons. Guess what this was? This was a reissue of the brown box. Now the box was white, hence white box. And it was the re-release of the classic Dungeons & Dragons. It even had a little starburst on the cover telling you this. And when I was pitifully asking my parents, but I need the rules to Dungeons & Dragons, they said, oh, and they saw this and they went and got it for me. So there I was looking at those rules. So right in front of me, I had Holmes, I had effectively the 1974 rules and I had the monster manual and then I had all these various secondary publication things too and I'm still going just like everybody else including the adults who were running those seminar games in the community activities or just like everybody else in the game stores sitting down to play D&D &D with a crowd of people wondering what on earth we are in fact looking at and all of us 100% 100% convinced 100% that there was a game to be played that it existed that if we read these things and hooked the pieces together in a logical fashion there is in fact externally a logical game to play so therefore we could easily find it by just sitting down and doing it, using our heads, making it work. The notion of an actual D&D, a real one, the one, the first one, the notion that it laid down and set and made this activity was firmly in place at a cultural level. As the hardbacks continued to be released for a total of four, I think, in the first really comprehensive notion of a publication of advanced Dungeons and Dragons, you had the Player's Handbook come out quite swiftly after the Monster Manual, and after a little bit of nail-biting delay, the Dungeon Master's Guide. I'm adding deities and demigods onto the end of that as 
from the outsider customer user base perspective as kind of nailing down the sort of metaphysical large scale mythological monster menu. So we have a pretty confusing array of things and the reality to face that if you played Dungeons and Dragons at any point between 1974 and 1980, that you were dealing with a mishmash of texts written by different people in strange relationships to one another, clearly advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which started at level one, not at level four as promised and grossly, obviously, completely incompatible with the Holmes publication. What on earth were you doing? What were we looking at? One of the big impacts on how to play D&D had emerged from the convention tournament context. So publications written, or rather activities written for those tournaments became modules. And this is where you started to see the first adventure pack modules, uh, the G series and the D series, all of these early sets of adventure supplements were coming out at the same time as well. This is where people learned how to play. If anything, you learn how to play D&D by sitting down and playing along with the group of people like at the hobby store or whatever, or you, looked at one of these and then all of that was seasoned by debate over this or that issue of dragon that somebody happened to have or this or that paragraph in the player's handbook that people are desperately attempting to shoehorn onto this understanding well what you end up with is the notion that this is about acquisition of treasure and this is about keeping your character alive. Here is where the context of the crawl became embedded strongly in the notion of D&D as an activity, what we came here for. It could not be more explicit in the tournaments. You sit down and there are multiple tables and each one has a DM and each one runs exactly the same experience as best as they can. That's why they have the boxed text so that everybody will be saying to the players exactly the same thing. And at the tables, only so many of those tables will go on to the next module. And that's those are the ones who get the most experience points. And now you know why treasure and killing generates experience points, because you have to kind of trade off. We've got to kill enough to get this much treasure, you know, whatever we you, whatever you end up with in terms of treasure, and who has ever basically uh, managed to make it through. So, and whoever gets the most experience points, those are the ones who go on. So the notion of characters as uh, relatively expendable because, you know, even if your character died at your table, your table got to go on to the next event. All of these things as literal values of the activity became part of the rules as understood. Whatever other priorities of play, you can winkle out by reading the text of play. Well, you know, Gygaxian, you're supposed to play for this, whatever, was as flotsam and jetsam in the face of this overwhelmingly powerful impact on what Dungeons and Dragons is and why we play. This would change in time, but as of 1980, 1981, this was the state of play. Those of us who were interested in other priorities of role-playing were swiftly turning elsewhere. Um, some people uh, preferred Tunnels and Trolls, not because it wasn't the crawl, it very definitely is the crawl, but it's whimsical and has a great deal more enjoyment in the moment rather than worrying about whether you're going to make it through so that you can go up to the next thing. And then you also had people with the immense interest in developing sagas and settings, and RuneQuest, of course, suited very nicely for that. Many of the other publications at the time, Dragon Quest is a good example, 
sort of did a little hula dance in regard to all these different ways or purposes of playing a guy with a sword. So, as I say, state of play, as of 1980, 1981 or so, directly impacted by not the presence of Dungeons and Dragons as a text, but an absence. And in response to that absence, a whole bunch of weirdly disconnected, scattershot published pieces of texts. 1980, 1981 is a significant period. For one thing, to get into perhaps a little too personal of an interpretation, I think this saw some pushback from Gary Gygax specifically against that tournament model of play. I think a lot of the articles in Dragon that he wrote were sounding kind of plaintive and shrill about, no, no, not like that. And his publications of uh, the World of Greyhawk folio uh, definitely indicated that there was some other way to do this that he favored. You also had the explosion, which had been building and not entirely absent prior to that, but the explosion of, hey, let's play something else with role-playing. Villains and Vigilantes in 1979, Champions in 1980, among other superhero titles, um, just hit the hobby stores and the brand new game stores, or at least the game role-playing game sections in game stores, just hit them like a bomb. You also had uh, the great, great publications of early RuneQuest, uh, 1979, 1980, the core rules, and then 1981, 1980 and 81, Cults of Prax and Cults of Terror, and all of a sudden the notion that you could really be working with something powerful here. Tecamel had taken hold a number of years before, but had not gained this kind of traction as product and as general perception. And you also the various others. Gamma World had become much more of a fun favorite than D&D itself. Playing a traveler was up and running. The notion that you had a range of role-playing games, the notion that this effectively underground publication of your notion, your way of play, was now characterizing the hobby far more than this notion of Dungeons and Dragons as this uber entity. However, that very thing received pushback of its own with the creation of the RPGA. And this occurred in 1980, um, and it redefined the relationship of Dungeons and Dragons to convention play, which still probably pound for pound, someone can correct me, but how much convention play, what proportion of it represents, what, what, what proportion of role playing as an activity does it represent relative to just people playing on their own out there, I don't know. But even if those proportions aren't easily sussed out, I think that convention play is a really important physiology of how to play being promulgated throughout the hobby. People go to the convention and they learn how to play there in their experiences and they receive perhaps some authoritative language. They certainly receive that sense of collective effort and group identity that plays such a big role in learning how to do anything. All right, there they are. Uh, what do they find in the RPGA? And what does this mean in terms of this religious talk? Let's stop there for a moment. That's going to be a part two thing. Let's stay with part one because I want to talk about Jesus. Specifically that, regardless of your position as to whether there was a two-legged homo sapiens who walked around with the name of Jesus or perhaps Yeshua and did or said this or that, regardless of that, it is non-controversial to say that the narrative of Jesus is 
not supported by documents. We have different components being blended at different times and then added to at still later times in a highly politicized context, producing a body or group of texts which then becomes part of another and larger body of texts, again, representing political interests that are highly different from decade to decade and particularly from century to century until this story holds together only because they're all in this same block of collected documents. That's what we have here. We have no particular actual play of D&D &D as a game activity from which a body of text then emerges to describe what it is and how to do it, and then that becoming a publication with teaching power. That sequence of events, which seems like a very logical thing to expect for any role-playing game, is not in place. We have instead the primary power of the entity being the belief in the entity, and that any document that we find at the time, somebody will wave around and say, see, see, the entity existed, just like you could find the grave of Yeshua or something and say, look, look, Jesus existed. That actually isn't the same thing. Well, Demogorgon strike me dead for using an anime as a source of a relatively profound cultural or philosophical claim, but I will call upon Ghost in the Shell standalone complex and talk about Dungeons and Dragons as a classic standalone complex. Only in those imitating it and only in those particular details of evidence of something occurring, only in the insistence that something occurred, do we actually find any substance at all. That to, to regardless of the fact that Gary Gygax and or Dave Arneson were actually playing games of these kinds in their rooms with other people, regardless of whatever occurred at this or that convention, regardless of any of those individualized and local phenomena, regardless of any of those, Dungeons and Dragons as an activity as perceived and valued didn't exist. The perception of the value did. Setting up perfectly for the notion not of a role-playing game, perhaps the first role-playing game or anything like that, but setting up for the notion of an ur er role-playing game, one that was played just right, the first, the original, the pure, the inspired, the source. The notion that Dungeons and Dragons as an activity that was collectively experienced by a large number of people during this time, to say Dungeons and Dragons was the first and the best has become a Nicene Creed for our hobby. And like the Nicene Creed, bearing no connection whatsoever to the events that have occurred, and also, most importantly, in relying upon the absence of an identifiable textual way to play as part of its power, and then completely logically, in its own terms, calling upon belief and profession of the belief, 
as a form of identity.